Welcome back to the Horse Racing Show, a simple show that tells you about horse racing each week. When they said, who do you want as your first guest, without hesitation, I said, Mike Pegram is the only one I want to get this show on the road. Uh, I've known him for years. He's a great friend. I don't know any owner that enjoys racing as much as Mike and really enjoys when he wins or when he gives it a try. And, of course, you know, real quiet, silver bullet day, great horses that he's had among many. And he joins us now from right outside of Reno, Nevada, in Carson Valley, I do believe. Mike, welcome into the show. Thank you, Kenny, and thanks for the kind words. Well, as you know, I mean them. And, you know, and everybody in racing is not as sincere as you and I are. Well, everybody in racing don't have as much fun as you and I do. We know we know we ain't dealing with brain surgery here. <laughs> you know, I always laugh about that, and it it's a tough audience sometimes. I did four. I hosted four Eclipse Awards, and it's wonderful. And 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 everybody that wins them, and you've won them, it's all great. But but sometimes people do ask. That that seems to be kind of a a very stoic award ceremony, say compared to Oscars, Emmys, uh, any kind of sports show. You know, some people don't get into it as much as we do. Oh, isn't that the truth? There's there, there's been a couple of those I wanted to take a pillow to, but uh, hey, we're changing. Though I heard they got Snoop Dogg playing down at the Pegasus this weekend for uh, headlining their uh, entertainment for the the big Pegasus event. So I'd love to see Snoop Dogg at the uh, the Eclipse Award. I don't I don't think he'd go over real good. You know, Snoop Dogg at the Eclipse Awards, wouldn't that be interesting, Mike? Because you know halfway through with the, just a, you know, just a second-hand thing, everybody would be getting up going back and getting extra potato chips and Doritos. <laughs> well, there's one thing about it. They wouldn't have to be censoring my horse's name anymore after Snoop Dogg got done with them. Well, <laughs> and that brings me to this. Before we talk about uh, any more of the horses, the names. You were you were on the on the no fly list, as we'll say, of the Jockey Club for many years. You might still be on it because of such names as "Is It In Good" and a few other names that you named your horses. That uh, the Jockey Club thought, well, maybe we ought to take a second look. Uh, that was after obviously got on the track and had success. I always enjoyed that. I always wondered what name is Mike Pegram coming up with next. Uh, we had a little fun with them, and they. They didn't have. They didn't appreciate the humor of some of the stuff. But on the other hand, like I always told them, we're not at Disneyland. We we are we are gambling. We are out here losing money, drinking beer, and having fun. And uh, again, I never named a horse that I wouldn't say in front of my mother. And uh, I had more respect for her than any woman in the world. So I figured if I put it on paper, they should accept the name. But you know what, Kenny? They didn't see it that way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you you can't have fun in this sport sometimes. Football, basketball, baseball, you can have fun. Sometimes you can't in horse racing. What can I say? But we're trying yeah, to... All I, we don't look as ridiculous as some of these wide receivers that score touchdowns. I, I would like to talk to those guys and ask them, what in the hell are they thinking when they do some of the stuff they do in the end zone? That makes my name look tame. Yeah, yeah it does make your name look tame. Uh, by the way, are you are you good now with the Jockey Club? I mean, do you get your names approved, or uh, do you still kind of a little uh, battle of wits? No, nah, you know what? Since I got in partners with uh, Paul and Carl, uh, they name both of the horses. If I come up with a good one, we'll get it. But it's uh, maybe I have matured as I've gone along a little bit. It just it's not as important as it was at one time, but. It did get to be one up and ship there for a while. Yeah, and I think for people that know, obviously in the game, for those of you that are uh, watching, listening to this that don't know, uh, the Jockey Club has to approve the names. Uh, it can only be 18 characters. That's why you see a lot of names run together sometimes so they can get all 18 in there. And then they have to have the approval uh, to make sure it's not too risque or it's not named after somebody famous that they didn't get the approval from. I basically cleared that up, didn't I, Mike? Yep, you sure did. And, you know, and, and Mike, Mike, would you put some fun names in there sometimes? What's your best name that you got in? Oh, the best name, uh, uh, the best name uh, I ever had and they took away from me uh, was uh, Liquor in Excess. <laughs> and that didn't make it. No, it made it. Oh, it made then, it. Uh, something, so it. Somebody knew, and we had it in the entry box, and they, they seen the name and said it was obscene. And I said, there ain't nothing obscene about it. 
You drink liquor in excess. And, and That's called drunkenness. That's called intoxication. I want to name the, the uh, horse liquor in excess because it was an excess filling. And uh, they refused it. So then I said, okay, if you think it's re- obscene, name her liquor. L-I-Q-U-O-R. They wouldn't accept the word liquor. I said, are you telling me there's obscene names up and down every street that has liquor stores? <laughs> but it didn't work. And we ended up settling on censored because they <laughs> censored me. So I just said, the hell with you guys, we're censored. <laughs> so that that's the way that one hooked up. And I had my little grandson, Gator. He had two imaginary uh, friends that he'd have horse races with. And one was pay my bills. And the other one was button my pants. So I submitted the name Button My Pants. They would not accept the name Button My Pants. Said it was obscene. I said I didn't say unbutton my pants. I said button my pants. <laughs> so anyway, uh, that's when that's when I poked a little fun and, and Buddy Bishop, who was a good man, that had yes, a he, tough job. He certainly is. He was. Uh, yes. So so finally, I end up naming that horse Buddy. Named me. Oh, I like that. I bet Buddy appreciated that too, didn't he? Yeah, a matter of fact, I think Buddy named me one, uh, one, one on Derby Day one year. I remember Buddy named me. Yeah. So, yeah, so here's what here's what we've learned from this uh, class watching in today: uh, keep your pants buttoned and don't drink liquor at a racetrack. I think that's the theme there, right, Mike? <laughs> I think you got it, Kenny. I think that's what. See, I knew you were the perfect guy to get this thing going. Uh, let me ask you about McKenzie right quick. It was going to run this weekend into Pegasus after winning the Malibu late uh, last year at opening day at Santa Anita. It's not going to run uh, now in the Pegasus. And what's next? Or have you talked to Bob Baffert, your trainer, much about that? No, nah, Bobby, the reason we didn't go to the Pegasus, you know, he laid a big egg at the Breeders' Cup because the horse was off in the Pennsylvania Derby. And Bobby still thinks he brought the horse back too quick to run him in the Breeders' Cup, and he just said, you know what, I just don't feel right shipping him down there. The horse is doing well. So, again, I haven't really discussed it with Bob, but the two logical races that's going to come up after the Pegasus, you can go to Oakland and run for a half a million in the Razorback, which I think is President's Weekend, or we can stay at home and run a mile and a quarter in the Santa Anita Handicap the first weekend of March. So, I think you'll see McKenzie turned up in, in one of the, one of those two places, and then after that, Bobby will have to decide whether he goes to Dubai. And uh, I kind of don't think he'll send him there uh, because, again, we'll have a fresh horse, and uh, there's nothing like winning in the good old USA and having some some fun with your friends and seeing your horses win. And I think he's going to be a real good four-year-old this year. You and Bob Baffert, your friendship, your relationship uh, professionally goes back. We're talking decades now. That's when I first met you guys. It was 92. Uh, you won the Breeders' Cup with 30 Slew. You won a Breeders' Cup race at, at, down at Gulfstream Park. I remember that. I'm sure you remember. You probably don't remember me interviewing you, but you remember that. Hey, I don't remember anything except the bag full of money. We had grocery bags full of money. If you remember, that was before, the, uh, before you had the uh, – all the money go in one pool because I remember 30 slews paid, I think it was $32 a golf stream. He paid $55 in New York. He only paid 1280 in California, but we had money spread all over the place because we knew we had a live horse that day. And I'll tell you a funny story on that one. Eddie Delahousse came into the, uh, the paddock and Bobby was nervous as hell first million dollar race and so on and so forth and Bobby told Eddie he said hey you know we got a chance to win it he said Bob I could have rode four other horses in here I know we're gonna win it <laughs> <laughs> how did and you Eddie <laughs> go ahead no no please tell me more about I would love to I love those stories I don't know, but you know, Eddie read what I was going to do is compliment the great, the little gray filly that, that we ran down that day it was me, Farah. Yeah, that's right. And it, it, I mean, oh, Eddie just wore down, wore down, and those two grays hit the finish line. And I think it was the first race of the day of the Breeders' Cup. It wasn't first race today, but it was the first Breeders' Cup race. And 
I know AP Indy ended up winning that day. I think Paulson's won three, but we that was a day of a party. All I can tell you that's that that's when the the racing world got a little taste of Bob Baffert and. And since 92, he's just been on a terror, and uh, I'm just glad I can say I was part of it, and I'm his friend. And and how did this friendship develop with that quarter horse trainer who's become uh, arguably the greatest of all time, one of the greatest of all times for sure in the thoroughbred business? Uh, it, it was funny. is I, uh, I had owned thoroughbreds with my father and uh, through the early, late 70s, early 80s, and then I went through one of those th- one of those things that always set you back financially called a divorce. So yeah, I got out I got out of the horse business, and I had met a family down in Arizona that was in the quarter horse business. Uh, matter of fact, it was Hal Earnhardt, and Hal called me up one day and he says, "Hey, would you buy a quarter horse with me?" And quarter horses wasn't there as expensive as thoroughbreds and I said yeah I'll go in with you so I got a trainer named Bob Bassard so I said yeah I'm in so long story short I met Bobby and uh from there I started buying some quarter horses with him and that's the way the relationship happened and what's really ironic so it was Hal Earnhardt that introduced me to Bobby and the year that I win the Derby with Real Quiet, Hal Earnhardt had the favorite in the Derby, which was Indian Charlie. Indian Charlie, that's right. The one-two punch that Baffert brought in that year. Yep. So Indian Charlie went off the favorite. He ended up running third. But, I mean, I'm sitting there looking at him and says, how can you figure here's two guys that meet in Arizona. He introduced me to Baffert. And this would have been 1985. And, 13 years later you're running against each other in the uh, greatest race in the world uh, you know what that's that's the favorite thing stories like that i think appeal a- as much i mean let's face it people are going out and gambling that's it they don't gamble they don't have races we know that but those kind of stories appeal to people i think in general and get people interested in the sport as much as trying to teach them for the first time out how to how to wheel a trifecta or something like that, you know, let them learn a little bit about the people and the and the personalities, and I think they come to the track more. That maybe drives them more. Oh, there's there's no doubt. It's it, it's no different than what, racetrack's the only place in the world where a billionaire will ask the guy parking his car who you like. <laughs> That's true, isn't it? <laughs> Oh, yeah. Here's a guy that's got hose in his shoes because he's running and picking up cars, and here's a guy that's made fortunes in his life, and he's asking him for advice. I mean, I love the racetrack. I love race trackers. I mean, I, you know, when you enjoy racing at Ellis Park, that means you really love the sport. And, uh, and I'm not knocking Ellis Park because, uh, that's where I kept my teeth on this sport, and I could I can remember begging my dad to take me every every day that he went when I was a kid. And so it's but it, it's what it is. It's the camaraderie of this sport that uh, that you get it from every gambler to gambler, horse owner to horse owner, and all the way through. Now I can't ask you to pick a favorite horse. That, that's impossible. But I mean. There's so many, you know, from Captain Steve looking at Lucky. We know about Real Quiet, Silver Bullet Day, still one of my all-time favorite fillies, Midnight Loot, uh, you know, going back to 30 slews. The, do you have one or two memories of some of those, though, that just really stand out for whatever reason, to be at the victory celebration or just the craziness of getting getting them to the track uh, when you didn't expect it to happen? Well, Real Quiet is the, key, the gift that kept on giving because – he was the sire of uh, a midnight loot. Mm-hmm. And uh, I can tell you all sorts of little tidbits on Real Quiet. But Real Quiet, I mean, he was a horse that, you know, everybody knows the story. He was bought for $17,000. I can remember having dinner at uh, Dudley's the night they bought the horse because I just came in and said, hey, we bought the fish. I said, who's the fish? And they showed me the page. And unbeknownst to a lot of people, real quiet was a well-bred horse. Yeah. And, um, and I looked at the page, I said, how much did he cost? They said 17,000. I said, does he have cancer? <laughs> they said, no, 
I said, well, why are you calling him the fish? He said, well, he's like a tropical fish. He looks beautiful from the side, but when he comes at you straight up, if you put up your finger, you can't see him. He was so thin. But, you know, he was the ugly duckling that uh, grew up into this big, beautiful, magnificent horse. Yeah. That, uh, you know, they should have won the Triple Crown, but, you know, that's the way racing luck hits. Uh, but then he did come back and uh, he starred two great horses for me. One was Pussycat Doll, who was a multiple grade one winner. And then the other one was uh, Midnight Loot, who has gone on to be a, a very um, reputable stallion in himself. So that's the reason I say Real Quiet's the horse that just keeps on giving. Oh yeah, and, and that was that was a special year, and brought a lot of excitement. And honestly, I wasn't even sure if we'd see a triple crown winner. At least in my lifetime, I'd seen so many close ones like that one, a silver charm the year before, and we go on and on. But then that buddy of yours, he's pulled it off twice in the last four years. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Well, and I, I got another one for you on this one, and I I still believe this in my heart of hearts. And everybody's got opinions in the horse business because that's what makes the horse business. But I always said that Bafford would buy a triple crown winner, and not taking nothing away from American Pharaoh or Justified, but Bobby didn't buy either one of those horses. Mm-hmm. American Pharaoh was bred by Zayad, and um, and I think Elliot picked out. Uh, um, justified, and Bobby just trained him. So I still think before Baffert's done, he's going to win a Triple Crown with not only is he a great horse trainer, the, what this man has done, well, the only reason why people know me is the, the quality of horses that he bought during the early days for not a whole lot of money. So he is a tremendous horseman, and I hope he does get his third yeah, it would be appropriate if that happened that his partner in that horse would be you. Uh, he's got a lot of good owners. He's got a, a lot of great owners, and that's the, that's one thing about Bobby that speaks so well of him. And, you know, we all know how irreverent he can be at times. And, matter of fact, he can almost be a half asshole. But he. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You've seen that side, Kenny. Uh, yeah, I have a couple, a couple of times. But honestly, if you guys weren't irreverent, it wouldn't be any fun to talk to you. Oh, no, that, that's true. But that's the reason why the good Lord gave him that uh, white hair, so he can look like Einstein. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, now more than ever, he'll be listening to this show, won't he? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'll be. I'll be getting. I'll be getting a text. What the hell are you saying on there? You say what is this? What is this horse racing show with Kenny Rice? What is this thing? When did this come from? <laughs> He'll probably say, "Who is this Kenny Rice guy?" Oh, that's that guy that interviews me when I keep winning those big races. Oh uh, gosh. Uh, there's one thing about Bob. Have you ever seen a camera you didn't love? No, and you know one of the, the great things about him, and, and I've I really got to know him better on those trip, obviously on those Derby runs with uh, starting in '96 with uh, Cavanier, um, is that you know he was like, and and Wayne Lucas I think was a guy kind of set that standard really, and then Bob just jumped right in on it too, being able to speak in sound bites as we say in the business, being able to give you know 10, 15, 20 percent, uh, 20 second interview answers. Uh, that made sense, it made you laugh, made you think, and, and you know, Baffert's got it down pat. He's had it that way for 20-some years. He is a, He's probably the most witty and uh, person that I know. And, and the thing about Bobby is, and, and I say this with all sincerity and respect, he doesn't have a malice bone in his body. No. I mean, some of the stuff he says to people, I say, if I said that, they'd knock me on my butt. But he can say it. And he, he says it without malice, and and uh, and he's he's truly a funny. He's a funny guy. Well, you you both are always entertaining. And out, here's an unsolicited here's an unsolicited testimony. If you're ever out in the Reno area, go to the Carson Valley Inn and stay. I love the place. Yes, my friend Mike owns it. I love the place. So even if he wasn't on the show. And uh, it's got, it, you know what, it reminds me of the old days, like when you'd go out to old Vegas and enjoy yourself. It's not, it's not corporate run, you know, you don't have to buy your tickets in advance and stuff. That's, that's what I loved about it. And the food's great, by the way. Uh, we're, we're country folk, Kenny, that's all I can tell you. We, we, 
It's uh, you treat people the way you want to be treated, and good things happen. Well, I'll ask you one more thing. It's a successful casino owner operator as well. Uh, you know, I, I wish there was some way, and I don't have it. And, and if I did have it, I'd make them pay me a big consulting fee like they have for a lot of things they've done. But I tell racing, you know, maybe figure out a way to let people in at a reduced price for not the triple crown, not the big events, but every day out there. Figure out a way to let them park a little cheap or something. Give them a program. Because, you know, you can go to a casino, you can lose money, and somebody gives you a buffet ticket free, and you figure, what the heck, it was only 500 bucks, and look, I get to eat a nine ninety five buffet free. <laughs> hey, I had an old marketing guy tell me one day, he said, the closer you get to free, the easier my job is. <laughs> That's the truth, isn't it? <laughs> it sure is. Oh. It sure is. So it's, uh, but I tell you, I, I, I thank you for thinking about me doing this call because I always love talking about these horses and this industry because it, it's been a big part of my life and, uh, I can never imagine living and, and not being part of it. Well, listen, thanks very much, my friend, and uh, I look forward to having Mike Pegram on any time he wants to come on, and especially if Snoop Dogg brings down the house, and I mean that literally, at the Eclipse Awards. We'll have to go and revisit this. You got it, Kenny. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you very much, Mike Pegram, our very first guest here on the Horse Racing Show.